I have a slightly um, love-hate relationship with Twitter. Um, so I'm sort of addicted to it and sort of loathe it in, in equal measure. But um, this short message from my writer, Gideon Defoe, has always been one of my favourite um, statements of the life. You know, a profession in my timeline dishes out tips and advice at the remorseless rate that writers do. I guess it's just generous to the spirit. I have this on my wall, and it's something that I feel sort of tries to keep me honest, keeps me from my tendency towards pomposity, towards trying to hold forth, towards you sort of deigning to actually give you advice that I believe is going to be helpful to you. Um, so in place of that, I tend to just sort of um, exacerbate and analyse my own insecurities, which is mostly what I'm going to be doing today. Um, a few years ago, um, my editor at a, an indie press called Salt, who based in Cambridge, and who I did four books of poetry with, published a book called 101 Ways to Make Poems Sell. But eight years after that, they ended up actually closing their, their own poetry list. Um, but the book has some very practical <laughs> advice. I didn't even have to criticism. It was kind of, you know, just a bad time for poetry in 2013. So it was a tough year. Um, <laughs> there are various chapters that just list tips and sort of things that you ought to do if you're preparing a manuscript of poems, if you're preparing kind of five poems to send to a journal. Whenever I've sent five poems to a journal, I usually find that I've got about three that I actually like, and I sort of scrabble around in my scraps and drafts file on my computer to find another two kind of half poems, um, just to make it look as though I have more than, than just three, and I'm sending the maximum that the magazine wants. Um, without fail, it's always those two cobbled together poems, just to pad out the submission that actually end up getting accepted <laughs> for publication. I'll make it up we will. After several sort of bits of quite practical advice on, on, on making submissions, Emery kind of turns to sort of look the reader or sort of aspiring writer directly in the eye and says, you, you also need to ask yourself what you actually think you're going to get out of this, out of publication. What is it that you actually want, what you think you're going to get? And if you're anything like me, your reaction to that is going to be, shut up, of course I do, of course I want this. I wouldn't be reading this book or doing anything towards writing if I, if I didn't. But it gave me pause when I first read it, and it was already too late by that point, but we published the book once. Um, it made me think of the people that I know some people I grew up with who started to make some headway in the, in the music industry. Sometimes actually to the point of sort of cutting a record with a, with a sort of indie record label. And, and, and then sort of quit and run away in horror from the, from the music scene for reasons they still won't quite go into with me. Um, as if from some kind of toxic miasma, sort of disillusioned with seen disillusioned with being a kind of, however minor, being a sort of public figure, having to stand behind their work and, and, and give it to people. It doesn't know really struggle with. There's, there's a psychoanalyst the writer, Adam Phillips, who often we read. And one of his best essays is on success, where he begins writing about J.S. Mill, the communist philosopher, who having imagined and projected forwards the successful implementation of everything he wanted to achieve, found himself unable to write a word and completely arrested by this sort of imaginary um, future projection. And Phillips concludes in the essay, um, we police ourselves with purposes, our ambitions, our ideals, and success stories that lure us into the future can too easily become ways of not living in the present, 
of not being present at the event, of blackmail, of distraction, ways, that is, of disowning or demeaning the actual disorder of experience. I want to suggest this morning that poetry and fiction present us a unique opportunity to record and explore and celebrate the actual disorder of experience, even as they attempt to arrange it in the form of poems and novels. But that there is a cost to that if our own terms of success involve writing and publishing. And, and part of that cost involves asking ourselves or confronting ourselves again and again with what we really want out of it. So if the answer is adoration, there may be simpler ways of going about that. <laughs> or it may not be something we really ought to wish for. In 2010, I was interviewed by the German poet and novelist Hans Enzensberg for a, um, a grant that I did not receive. Um, one of the other writers, uh, he was interviewed, got it instead. And she was a lot better than me, so that's why I did grudge with that. Um, in a kind of two hour conversation with him, chain smoking, and drinking um, coffee from his, from his ancient German percolator, he painted this chilling picture of his contemporaries, of other extremely established, celebrated writers um, in their sort of 60s to 80s, um, at kind of the top of their field, having had a celebrated career, internationally eminent, successful poets and novelists, household names, bestsellers, also sort of critically acclaimed as well, fortunate enough to make a living off their creative work. Enzensberger painted this image of them huddled around in resentful gossip circles over the annual Nobel Prize for Literature shortlist, <laughs> feeling, feeling slighted, overlooked, and neglected every time it rolled around and they weren't on it. Somehow unable to grasp how lucky they were to be writing and publishing at all. And it's an image that's really stayed with me because there are, I think, these kind of black holes within all of us which, although we may not think so in advance, can never be filled even by adoration, even by success. But mostly, I think we're writing in order to, sorry, I'm a little bit very excited with people in this, uh, with that, um, we're writing specifically to honour the actual disorder of experience. We write against the lack of subtlety, the degrading shorthand and reductive pragmatism in the service of a particular message with which we're bombarded by a language on a, on a daily basis through comment, through media, through politicians making statements um, along the lines of you can't be a socialist if you drink lattes and things like that. We kind of write to try to get to the bottom of why somebody might even say that, to demythologize it. Partly it indicates to me that these are people who've never even walked around a high street in any town, city or village to find that it contains a Costa and Starbucks, usually full of people drinking lattes, um, wherever it is. Trying to resist the urge to make this into a sort of first chapter of Tristram Shandy, um, <laughs> but I'm going to go back to the age of seven um, and think about my own development as a writer, my own sort of failed attempts. At writing, I'd always, I'd always wanted to write, and I'd always written. And my dad is a um, was a self-employed translator, and he would always give me his old typewriter or word processor when he upgraded for tax reasons every every few years. Um, the first one was one of those ones that ran on these kind of golf ball-like things, and had a tiny single line of green letters saved onto these big seven-inch floppy disks, um, and then it would kind of type out the document for you like a kind of auto piano afterwards, which I really loved that type of answer. Um, so I would sit there every evening at the age of seven in, in, in lieu of developing any kind of meaningful relationship with my peers, and this went on for most of my childhood and, and youth, all the way through school, most of the way through sixth school. Like the majority of my sixth form was an ordinary comprehensive school in a light industrial town called Chard in the southwest of England, A-levels were a kind of ejector seat to free you from the orbit of small town suffocation. I was really annoyed whenever it's exam results time and that meme circulates of um, a woman holding up a, a piece of paper with um, 
Um, it's like, oh, I just, I just took my English GCSE and I failed. Kids, you don't need exams to succeed in life. You just need to dream big and um, kick ass. Um, it always really pisses me off. It's like, that, well, yeah, that's fine if you have a lot of capital. You know, if you kind of have something to fall back on, then great, just dream, dream big. Um, otherwise, you know, you kind of need that study. You need that opportunity to actually escape from, from where you come from. And this was, I've been thinking a lot about this recently. This was the sort of early 90s. And it was assumed at that point that we were going to go to university. This was the first year that fees had been introduced, and they were still really quite affordable. It was a thousand pounds a year. Um, which led to a much broader spectrum, both of ages and of, of, of people going to university at that point. And it was understood that this could be pretty much anywhere in the country, wherever we sort of liked the look of, from the prospectuses, which were pretty similar, we're going to tour. I should add that any Northern city to us seemed impossibly glamorous because it was where the, the real football teams came from, teams that weren't Yeovil or Exeter. Um, and there wasn't really any question of what you should study. There was nobody official who put any pressure on you whatsoever. So you want to be an artist? That's great. Here's a, uh, here's a batch of uh, prospectuses for fine art courses. Look at them. Choose somewhere. So like I said, the fees were still comparatively very low. There was something utopian about it. I think an opportunity that was once afforded to around 4% of the population had been rolled out, multiplied by 10. So this was available to almost anybody who wanted to go. So I feel as though we were the children of a great and genuine social expansion. And if we somewhat took that for granted, we didn't have to look too far to feel lucky. A good deal of our parents or even all the siblings hadn't necessarily had the chance. Nobody would say I was the first person in my family to go to university as a kind of inverted badge of honor because of that. It was rare if you weren't. It was around the time that uh, Tony Blair said, we are all middle class now. Still some are more middle class than others. We have a very odd definition of the word middle in this country, I think. Um, but anyway, the kids who were going to read law or engineering were, we felt, being forced to by their authoritarian parents, and we pitied them. Something that I lose sleep over now as a lecturer in English and creative writing is whether I'd have actually made the same choice with fees set at £9,000 a year as I did in the 90s. Anecdotally, a friend of mine who works as a secondary school art technician tells me that the, the number of his A-level art students who go on to study art foundation courses in preparation for studying fine art at university has reduced by roughly three quarters over the last decade. It used to be that quite a lot of his A-level art students were going on to do this, and that really isn't the case anymore at the state school in Somerset where he teaches. One of the arguments, and I feel that there is a sort of tactical rolling back at the moment of the expansion of the accessibility to the university. One of the arguments that really gets my hackles up is this idea that there are too many writers, too many poets, too many novelists. Because I suppose I think wasn't this something that we wanted when access to studying writing was, was opened up, was widened, so that more people could go, so that more people could become writers. When it comes down to it, I think it borders on a sort of social eugenics. What the argument really is saying is that the wrong kind of people are able to call themselves writers. We may not be middle class, but these people from the wrong strata of the vast middle class um, who are now writing. Um, and we don't ever say, something that's always struck me, is we don't ever say there are too many athletes or sports people. We don't say there are too many musicians. We actually don't even say that there are too many visual artists or, for instance, ceramicists or glass sculptors. We kind of let them get on with it. The letters of their qualifications displayed innocently, guilelessly, proudly after their names in provincial and city galleries. It's not questioned, and nobody tries to make them feel bad about it, the way they seem to like to with writers. In 2001, I just finished a, an MA in creative writing at the University of Exeter, which I did straight off my English degree by taking out a bank loan. In retrospect, this was the best decision that I ever made in my life, but in the, in the year after, it felt like it had been a terrible mistake. I moved to Bristol without having sorted out a job, naively thinking my resume, which included working in a second-hand bookshop, and putting pints in a small hotel in rural Somerset might maybe employable in a city packed to bursting with hundreds of thousands of talented twenty-somethings. It took roughly 106 unanswered job applications to dent my enthusiasm. <laughs> I had one interview for the complaints department of Orange Mobile Phones and didn't get it, and then started paying my rent by drawing cash out with one credit card 
and buying egg McMuffins with another shinier credit card. <laughs> the loan repayments from my MA had begun, which I dealt with by extending my current account over from 2,500 to 3,000 pounds. This went on for four months, during which time I was too full of self-loathing to either write anything or to admit that I was willfully plunging myself into the thousands of pounds of bad debt. During this time, my partner had nursed me through my MA whenever I felt like quitting, which was roughly once a fortnight. I had a nervous breakdown followed by a prolonged psychotic episode during which she thought I was an actor. I was inclined to agree. <laughs> and between the somewhat paltry one hour a month NHS psychiatric sessions and my low self esteem, I did my best to make a bad situation worse. I somehow still found the money to be drunk quite a lot of the time and lay awake at night hallucinating a dark blue rotting forest engulfing me in time lapse. Now, I was. Lucky enough to have parents who were still talking to me, and we get to convert my childhood bedroom into a foot spa or poker room. My pavement poster was still blue tacked to the wall. I realised this is something of a privilege, not everybody gets to move back home after screwing up their lives. Um, so for a while I lived there rent free in exchange for dicing the occasional onion. I found a job doing data entry for the county council, paying down the debt I'd accumulated in half a year, which somehow dwarfed my undergraduate student loan. You'll probably know if you've ever done that data entry is impressively boring. It's worse than prayer. Um, and it's very sedentary. I put on roughly two and a half stone during, during those years. Um, one of the best things about working for university is that you get to pace all the time. You get to pace when you're teaching. You get to pace when you're marking. You hold a sort of batch of scripts in your hand and you just walk up and down your corridor. Nobody stops you. You can also sort of change the desk in the same way that you are in, in a lot of jobs. Um, Data entry also uses almost none of your energy, though, which is quite a good thing. You can go days without experiencing a single thought, creative <laughs> or otherwise. And this builds over time to a desperation to do almost anything else. At one point, I considered training as a secondary school teacher. And I'm not exaggerating when I say I think I'd have lasted longer in the army. <laughs> but it builds to a desperation to make things, to make something which gives you life meaning. And in my case, that was to sort myself out and to start writing again. And I won't dwell on this, but after a while, when I wasn't playing FIFA International Soccer or my little brother's GameCube, I went back to writing, adding to the coursework that I'd started, finishing the various short stories I'd tried to start, writing these weird long sequences of narrative prose poems, and reading full collections by the poets I encountered on my course, trying to fill in the, the blanks and the lacunas of the poets I'd neglected or even started, which is really a life's work, I don't give a stop doing that. After a couple of years, um, I remember hiding in a toilet cubicle at the um, County Council office, rearranging my 30-page submission for the, um, the Eric Gregory Awards, which is a um, poetry prize for poets under 30. There's been, as a sort of a side, there's been quite a lot of debate about age limits on prizes recently on, on, on Twitter and otherwise, which kind of interests me. And I, kind of, I see the reasoning for the argument kind of against them, in that there is a sort of intersection of various privileges that make it more likely that you've been able to start writing younger or have not, have had that denied to you for some reason. And also there's clearly something of a sort of cult of youth of the new, which I don't think is going away anytime soon. It's a shame, but if we're honest, some of the people making this case are people in their 30s who have chosen to do other things for some decades up until this point, and are now kind of turning on people who made some headway when they were younger quite possibly made that headway against the odds. You know, how, how can you say, how can you accuse somebody? Um, by sacrificing time, they could have spent doing young people things. I don't think time itself is as much of a privilege as money, but if you can find a couple of hours a night, and you can, and I have two young children, um, so it's the only time that I get to write really after the day job um, is once they're asleep, between sort of 9 and 11 p.m. before my head hits the desk. Um, you really can find that time. It doesn't need to be that much. It's just like Doris Lessing, it's like the conditions are always impossible. Find an hour, find an hour a day. Um, start drinking slightly later. <laughs> like maybe watch slightly fewer box sets. You know, there is time. You know, if you have time to do that, then there is time to write as well. Um, and like, here's a pen. There aren't quite the same barriers as there are to say something like scuba diving. Um, <laughs> So it kind of, I mean, it kind of pissed me off, I guess is what I'm saying, these arguments against prizes that are specifically for the young. I think they do have a place when the majority of young people are going to be completely economically disenfranchised and never retire. Should the target of our anger really be the foil young poets prize? I think probably not. Um, I think it's more productive to think about sort of donating to bodies like Arts Emergency that directly take action to encourage kids from disadvantaged backgrounds to study the arts, to study the humanities, which they might not have considered doing. They do a lot of good work in, in, in that way. Or 
influx presses, current call for submissions from women and colour writers. And these are genuine proactive initiatives that are trying to sort of redress the imbalance in literature at the moment without turning generations against each other, which I think is thoroughly unhelpful. Anyway, during this time, during my sort of purgatorial um, five years of data entry, um, I'd also started reading at open mic nights at Poetry Nights, taking the train down to Exeter to this monthly Poetry Night in the Arts Centre there, which was in a tiny little black room on the second floor of the Phoenix Arts Centre. And honestly, just preparing a five minute open mic slot every month with a couple of new poems was really sustaining. And I'd be lying if I said that having studied writing, the extraordinary chance that I had, notwithstanding the permission to do that, I'd be lying if I said that it didn't help. It did. And of course, you don't need an MA to be a writer. It'd be weird and offensive to suggest that you do you need a qualification to be a writer. But dear God, it's a lifeline once you're trying to do it by yourself, once it's just you, a word processor, and an infinite wall of indifference. Every seminar, every workshop, every tutorial, every piece of advice you're given comes back to you then, and you use it, you feed off it. So after four years of the data farm having paid off, or at least reconsolidated several loans and living at this point in a bedsit above a Greek restaurant in Taunton, I knew that what I wanted to do was to try to get funding to do a PhD. I knew what I wanted to write it on, and I kind of read enough to um, demonstrate in a proposal that it was making an original, original contribution to the field, albeit the small, scrubby field of the prose poem, which several critics don't believe really exists as a literary form. After one of the aforementioned open mics, I met the editor of a small press called Stride Books, based on Devon. He said that he liked my work because it was weird and also it wasn't so boring that it made him want to kill himself. Um, <laughs> and he said, why don't you write a few more, like the one you just read, and we'll put a pamphlet together. It'd be nice, we'll have a little thing to hand out to people at readings. Um, and I was delighted by this and more than usually motivated to spend the spare minutes at work with my notebook open and my evenings writing it up. A year later, a box of my complimentary copies arrived, and I ripped into it excitedly. This is um, sideways, the sort of colour of the book. Um, pulled a few out. I noticed that my 40-page pamphlet had a, had a spine, making it technically my first full collection of poetry rather than a chapbook. Um, I called Lloyd Dell, the editor, and um, had a conversation, during which it emerged that there'd been some miscommunication between him, the cover designer, and the, and the printers. He was quite positive about it. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's a book. We didn't really talk about doing it, a book. He said, no, no, that wasn't, that was an accident. <laughs> but it's really but the spine's really, really thin. I said, I don't know what happened. It was meant to be a pamphlet. You can barely read my name on the spine. It's, it's so thin, but it, it did have a spine, so it was, it was a book. I said, yeah, I, mean, I haven't taken out the print, so I actually just keep it. It's lovely. I mean, you know, I'm not going to, you know, he basically put it in, he wasn't going to uh, pulp 200 books and reprint them as pamphlets, that that was basically, um, he'd go bust as a, as a small press if he did that. So, I was left with this, um, with this first book that I had not meant to publish as a, as a first collection. Um, and by this point I had a place on the PhD because I'd, I'd escaped from data entry and my supervisor was seriously annoyed by this, by this sort of printing error and he felt quite sensibly that I should be building up to my first collection over, over the next few years, placing the occasional poem in a journal, gradually winnowing several hundred pages of poetry to the required 50 okayish pages of poetry. And that I should be aiming higher than a print run of 200 with an experimental indie publisher. But I was kind of too elated to have a book out to listen to any of this advice at all. And in the event, by sheer accident, it ended up being something that worked for me, in that I was picked up by a slightly larger indie publisher called Salt, who I mentioned before, um, for my second book, um, having just dropped Lodell and Strife um, without even asking him if that was okay, I to water a lot of drinks. Um, and my first collection with Salt, which is my second book proper, was shortlisted for the Ford Prize in 2007. Now, 2007 was a really strong year for debut collections of poetry. It was won by Daljit Nagra, there were five very, very good books on that shortlist for debut collections. I don't think I'd have got a look in if this had been my first book of poetry. Um, and that kind of would have been that, basically. The book would have sunk more or less without a trace. I wouldn't be here talking to you. I wouldn't have really carried on publishing, I don't think. Um, and this isn't something that you can plan for. You don't know who the judges of any kind of shortlist are going to be in any given year. If you did, you'd be on a hide and nothing trying to account for that. You write what you're capable of if you were cynically trying to write what you thought was on vogue or might please a particular powerful judge. I don't really even know what that would look like. I'm not sure it's possible, let alone worthwhile thing to do to yourself until you're writing. Because there was an angle um, at 26, I was the, 
the youngest poets who have been shortlisted, there were several broadsheet articles about it because it, it was a sort of um, not particularly interesting, but it was a, a, a media story. There was a way they could spin it and, learn this, and write about it. This was kind of pre-social networking, kind of early days of, of, of Facebook, just sort of pre-Twitter, um, and before the, um, the incomparable Mariah Carey had coined the word haters. So I was genuinely surprised to find that every online article about the Ford Prize was appended by between 700 and 1,000 comments of absolute bilious rage by people with, with made-up names. And far from taking some pride in annoying the weeping sack of fuckballs which made up the emerging commentariat, I was thin-skinned enough to react like a child who's just had his balloon pop off my work, suddenly had the exposure and potential leadership I'd only dreamed of, and every single one of them wanted to kill me. <laughs> I sunk into a one-off episode of clinical depression during which I was banned from looking at the internet at all. It was a useful formative experience. You gradually go helpfully numb, taking the praise with the same sedated grace you take the appropriate. I put in brackets, is it's true. Um, it's not true at all. You still feel every slight um, <laughs> profoundly. Um, and, 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 and anytime somebody says something nice, you feel that profoundly as well. Um, but to this day, and I think one of the best effects that it had on me is that to this day, I've never participated in a discussion board, a Facebook group, or even a comment thread about poetry because um, it puts me right back at that frame of mind. I don't like it. And over, over, the, over the decade, this has probably left me with a lot more time to actually write um, <laughs> rather than to waste time on the internet. Um, in spite of that, and in spite of not actually winning the Ford Prize that year, which was weird and very disturbing, it was clearly the foundation of my career, if you can call it that. It's the reason I'm an agent, it's the only reason I was able to carry on publishing poetry with any kind of audience at all, the only reason I got a lectureship, and the only reason that I was invited to speak to you. You could say that it was one lucky break or good timing, but I want to remind you that far worse, for me, it was based on a stapling accident. <laughs> that is why anything that went right for me since happened. It was a printing error that made my first pamphlet into a, into a book. And essentially when people ask me for advice about how I got started, I feel that like I can legitimately tell them that I haven't got a damn clue. <laughs> you can use cheap sports metaphors like I wanted it enough, but it's really more the case that you are just doing it anyway. You don't really know what else to do, and you do it doggedly. You know this, largely in isolation, aware of the countless great books that are published in sync more or less without a trace. Hopefully that gives you some trace element of humility and gratitude, but it's also quite possible it could turn you into a seething conspiracy theorist. The day I make up a fake identity so I can shitpost under a positive guardian and poetry review about a younger poet's work is probably the day I'll truly have arrived as a writer. <laughs> So something fairly important in this arbitrary publicity lobby was an agent. So in the first meeting that I had with my agent, Georgia Garrett, works at Georgia's College of the White, um, still represents me now, um, she said, and this, this was 2007, she said, how long will it take you to, um, to, to write a novel, do you think? And, um, and I said, well, I don't know, 500 words a day, which is six months a year, so I've pretty much already, already written it. Um, and 10 years later, my first novel <laughs> was published. Um, I want to kind of select just a couple of points from that decade of not managing to write a novel, during which, as ever, I repeatedly decided to quit writing altogether, um, which would allow me to mention some issues in relation to um, indie presses and the mainstream and some of the differences of working with them. And I've worked with a lot of different kinds of presses, from sort of things that run out of somebody's attic to the like, sort of medium sized ones to the, to the sort of mainstream before the state of Collins. Um, so a bit of an option to talk about Sol, talk about Tim Street. Um, I'd have four poetry pages published by Sol. They tended um, to get some glancingly reviewed occasionally, quite rarely got into bookshops particularly, but they did a lot for me, Sol. They kind of started me, so I'm quite, I feel quite a sense of loyalty to them. But aside from the brief high watermark of the second book, we've got a shortlisting, there was this sort of massive diminishing return. So I think my fourth book with them, where I felt so I'd really changed my way of writing, I'd really changed my sort of poetic style and voice. Um, I think it sold about 106 copies or something. It, just, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter that I've changed what I'm doing at all. Absolutely nobody is, is paying attention apart from my mum. And, and this was kind of a bleak moment for me. And it was around the same time that um, Salt closed the poetry list as well. So I was sort of left without a poetry publisher, without much desire to write poetry, and with two full-length failed novels that were just awful, that, that weren't beautifully written enough to justify the lack of a compelling story, and didn't have a kind of um, dynamic plot to justify the bad writing. Um, and that kind of, it gets you sort of thinking about the way that sort of prizes, and I think particularly for indie presses, for small presses, prizes become almost too important. Um, Tindall Street were a Birmingham-based novel publisher who were brilliant, who focused on writers based in the Midlands, um, launched the careers of um, Maggie O'Farrell and Catherine Flynn, two of the best writers in the UK. Um, 
But the thing that happens if, if, if one of your writers as a small press does particularly well, um, they tend to leave. They tend to get an offer from Faber or Penguin or something like that. And you, you want the best for them, so you let them go. But gradually you lose the writers who are selling. And the prize committees, because there's quite a vibrant scene, I think, in indie literature, the prize committees tend not to throw a bone to the same small press more than once or twice. Um, so with Salt, they made a lot from a shortlisting of the novel, um, an excellent novel, The Lighthouse by Alison Moore. Um, and that's going to sell, like, you know, the best part of 100,000 copies, I it's a shortlisting for the book of um, But then it's not necessarily going to happen again. It kind of isn't a sustainable model, unfortunately. Um, and you can end up just getting into some trouble. It's easy to see how that story kind of goes. Tintin Street ends up, ends up folding, tragically, which is um, a big shame, I think, certainly for the West Midlands and for some literature publishing them together. Um, it's doubly impressive, I think, given the stark costs of risk-taking, that indie presses are where you generally find the experimental, the courageously, truly representative, the sidelined and marginalised. Does the editor of Blue Moose Books said recently it's almost as if they're doing research and development for the, for the mainstream presses. So I kind of, I didn't have, I didn't have a poetry publisher, I didn't have a novel that was, that was, that was any good. Um, the idea for the transition kind of arrived in the form of just a couple of scenes It was partly born out of sort of irritation about the um, housing crisis and things like that. It still took me a long time to get a, sort of get a first draft that was even barely readable. Um, so the second reason for failure at the second moment is just generally not being very good at writing a novel, especially the plot, especially the story. I had to get used to writing on that kind of scale. A friend of mine who's an artist kind of likens it to um, changing the, the size of the canvas that you're working on, going from painting miniatures to, to, to painting something to the size of a, of a wall. And you're going to have to have a lot of kind of failed attempts to it. You are going to have to write full-length things that are just no good, where you get every mistake out of your system. Um, but my agent kind of kept me on enormously patiently and kind of mentored me through the failed moments, even though they weren't really going anywhere. Um, and you accept, if you have any perspective on your work at all, generally that, that what you've done isn't enough, that your agent is in a partnership with you, that they have a better perspective on whether the book is any good or not than you do, etc. Um, and part of what I had to learn for myself, and I've only learned by getting it wrong a couple of times, is quite how focused and systematic a novel ought to be to hold a reader's attention for 300 odd pages. Um, I particularly struggle with delivering on a promising setup with exposition and don't know the following slide is more or less a verbatim cut scene from the last quarter of my book. Should we have an important revelatory conversation? By this bent? Sure, we're not. Carl tried very hard to keep still. Um, I kept sort of lapsing into this. I kept sort of lapsing into these sort of terrible um, Overhearings that ended up being completely vital to the plot, and this was something that just had to continually over and over again. I had to say, "This is terrible. This sort of—it's not true. It's not plausible. It's kind of—it's worse than coincidental. It's worse than Hardy. You know, your book has more coincidences than Hardy does." Um, we really need to work on that. And, and this was—you know—I would spend ages just walking up and down the hallway of my house, kicking one of my children's balloons up and down um, in frustration. A lot of that time spent not writing, just thinking through the same thing. Like, how do I, how do I get across this kind of exposition without it being an exposition? It seems almost impossible to me. But it's quite clearly kind of wrong because it's sort of lazy and untrue, I guess, when, when a plot point is weak and invites a kind of weak writing from me. And going back to what we're really even doing here, what we want out of it, so it's, it's really a case of what we are representing. And um, here I'd like to talk more about my experiences on, on an MA in creative writing, which was back in 2001. Um, during this course, um, we frequently had to share work in progress and give each other feedback, This is the way of some classic writing workshop. Um, about halfway through the year, we admitted to each other, a group of about 10 students, that um, this process of sharing work was a lot easier with poetry than it was with prose. And my feeling on that, in poetry, for me, the, the isolation of a specific moment, however naturalistic the aesthetic and the delivery, is always surreal, even a profoundly ordinary poem like um, Edward Thomas's Adlestrop is a profoundly surreal poem, and the insistently reasonable voice only adds to this for me, a sense of 
why. So poetry to me is often about context. There's a distance somehow, even if the poem is very personal, because you've written it as a poet, the medium is kind of the message there. And fiction, by contrast, uh, uh, we as student writers found much more exposing and uncomfortable to share as a work in progress with each other. Just without exception, all of us struggled with this, struggled with bringing in our kind of 3,000 word excerpts, everybody else having read them and, 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 and telling us what they thought. And why that is, is I think because even in a 2,000 word short story that's very concise and complete, these are your thoughts, your characters that you've invented set up, punished, redeemed. Essentially, these are your judgments on the world and everyone in it. And it was a lot more painful to find out that this was wrong or skewed or ignorant than it was to be told that your metaphors needed sharpening up a bit, in the case of a poem. And that's as it should be. It should be uncomfortable, it should be difficult. It's best to confront this early on. And why exactly should my worldview be imposed on anyone else? What am I actually giving people. You can't also I think, talk about representation without um, thinking of gender, and you don't need to glance at um, Vida's statistics to see that the imbalance is still completely unacceptable. And it's kind of an absurd situation presenting, I do some talks on literary criticism and publishing to my students. It's, it's a really odd thing, um, talking to my students who are about 80% women, um, and presenting them with these kinds of statistics, which goes fairly across the board, the LRB is particularly bad for it. Um, but you always wonder really what you're supposed to say to them, and go out and, go out and change it. They'll all, um, they'll all die fair soon. Um, <laughs> best of luck. It's essentially indefensible, but the fact that these discussions are actually happening now is hopeful. I think provided we continue to pay attention to the beginning of some redress. Thinking a little more about representation, thinking about gender, thinking about sort of the, the male voice in writing as well. Um, as a white, more or less straight, low middle class male writer, I want to talk a little bit about examples. I'm quite lucky in that my own dad was a, a good example of a, of a human being, somebody who would never hesitate to intervene if he saw any instance of harassment, cruelty, or injustice with little thought for his own safety. He's not a polite person, he's a, he's a good person. That's sort of besides the point, um, because I still could have turned out nothing like him, and by my lights, I am not nearly as good a human being as he is. But nonetheless, he was a strong example. But whatever your folks are like, you're still surrounded from childhood onwards by a kind of miasma of toxic masculinity and a social pressure to weakly, pathetically condone it. If anything, you have more liberty to choose your friends as you get older, to edit your social circle until you're not really exposed to that kind of thing. It shocks you, as it should, when you are. Some of the grimmest, most racist, misogynistic or homophobic jokes that I've ever heard remain those circulated in the primary school playground from the age of about seven through to secondary. And it's not just among friends who are the wider social circle you encounter like part-time work as a teenager. It's kind of all around you. It's in music videos, movies, television, novels. It's repeated and reinforced. It was in song lyrics, and I'm not even talking about the kind of macho grandstanding bullshit. It's easy and even comforting to not see yourself in that. But I mean, it was equally present in the kind of whiny, my girlfriend left me existential soft rock that boys like me tend to favor. And maybe there's something adolescent about that which just rings true. Um, and obviously just take inspiration wherever you find it, and heartbreak is as great a subject as any. But it's sort of this, in a way, that I sort of come back to, that it's so far overbalanced. There's something distinctly male in that sense of ownership. Our relationship is my material. If this was more 50-50, perhaps it wouldn't be such an issue. Um, and I guess what I'm saying is that the bar is set so dangerously low that it's easy to expect very little of yourself. So yourself as a good, decent person, I would never make a joke like that, make a fake laugh at it for basic social survival. As a side note, most of the primary and secondary school jokes weren't even funny to the people telling them. They were knowingly obscene, offensive and transgressive. The more they had to be delivered in a conspiratorial whisper, the better. You were aware even of the transgression attached to the fact that you weren't supposed to be talking about things like that as an eight-year-old. Um, there was disgust even for the teller. And I think that stays with some people. And that's all I hear when a sort of self-proclaimed right-wing comedian moans online about freedom of speech. It's just sort of edgy infant on his lunch break. In writing this, I just remembered the, um, the one time that it was challenged, that, that kind of dialogue was challenged in my, in my time at school. It was around about year 10, we were walking back from PE, and um, the conversation among my contemporaries turned to, to breasts. I mean, some of us were talking about this, the athletic boys, the popular boys, and they're the ones who tend to set the tone, occasionally condescending to include the weeds if they happen to fall in step with them on the path. 
You can avoid the alpha, beta, male nonsense and still observe and identify yourself against that type because they're kind of nice guy in the vertical ones can have catastrophic psychological ramifications as you grow up and not. The coalescence being one form of machismo and another is probably followed for doing peace. But anyway, this one boy, and I'll call him Nate, was the authority and spoke at length in detail about our contemporaries' breasts and what they were like. And this is the thing, you don't really need to contribute to the conversation, you just <laughs> smile along with it. You may not be that guy, but you're with him and you're excited by it. There's one other kid, I'll call him Bob, who was <laughs> overweight and got picked on a lot for it in a kind of classic early 90s way, um, interrupted him, and Bob's voice didn't tremble the way mine would have done, and said, do you think that's an acceptable way to talk about women? And they said, what? And Bob said, I said, do you think it's okay to talk about women like that? And Nate said, yes, Robert, I like tits. And everyone laughed. And Bob sniffed, met his gaze unblinkingly and said, well, I didn't think it's acceptable at all. A couple of years ago, I was on a festival billing with Jabari Yassim, the um, former editor of the Washington Post and key figure in the Black Lives Matter movement. So, um, and he was talking about his book, The N-Word, Who Can Say It, Who Shouldn't, and Why. It was a great reading and discussion. At one point in the Q&A, Asim said that he wasn't interested in what people said in their living rooms, that that would be insane, trying to police what people say in private. His argument was that we're talking about the public sphere, that's the point, that includes culture and media, it includes some half-light culture of social networks. There are plenty of out and out idiots who seem to think this is happening, they thought policing in private spaces, if that were even possible. But all they're actually reacting to is people telling them that their wrong opinions are wrong when they publicly express and disseminate them in the public sphere. See also columnists with platforms that reach millions starting with a sentence like, we're not allowed to say this anymore. Um, and it's an almost pathological inability to recognise their own prejudice and cruelty so very quickly they double down, play the victim. What we've been thinking about recently is that there's something unique about the novel in that it's where the public and the private spheres converge. As a form, it's completely public. It's published, broadcast, performed before audiences. But what you're actually writing, the dialogue, the inner thoughts, sometimes the utterly humiliating thoughts of the characters, is totally private. So it's this kind of dramatization of the private sphere um, in a public medium, public form. When I'm losing sleep over whether I should run my mouth off at all about anything ever in poetry or prose. I think it's this that I'm turning over in my head. What are our duties? What do we include in the back? My own three big themes, which I seem to return to quite a lot of class, relationships, and mental health, none of them uncontroversial, always easily glossed over and anathematized. Something which occurred to me on about the third draft of the transition is that it needed to be pushed forwards in time a little to bring the themes I was exploring into sharp relief, that it needed to become, in a sense, a sort of very near at hand dystopia. Um, and like most people my age, I'd read the sort of big three dystopian novels in, in, in English lessons at school, so Brad and Huxley and Orwell, and written some exact of essays about characterization. And, um, my English teacher also let me. Um, Nabokov's Ben Sinister, which is the first novel that operates in English, set in a fictional city of Padokrat, wherein power has been seized by a new leader who promises to improve the lives of ordinary people. The protagonist is a famous philosopher, Adam Krug, whose wife dies in hospital in the opening chapter. Krug is under institutional political pressure to support the party and endorse their message. He refuses as Paddock gradually imprisons and eliminates his colleagues, friends, associates, and eventually his young son, whom he accidentally <coughs> murders instead of kidnapping. Um, if I was trying to be topical, I'd say it was a good novel for my time, but I don't know, it seems to be pretty good at projecting forwards without fiction, with naive optimism for myself, totalitarian, technological, and environmental apocalypse for the world. Also, my dog survives. Um, in an initial draft, the transition wasn't a dystopia at all, it was just set in the vein of present. Um, but in conversations with my editor, we felt that it, sort of, it needed to be pushed forwards in order for this sort of scheme, in order for this intervention into reality to make that much sense. So I had to add things like slightly improved technology, self-driving cars, and, um, and uh, self-replenishing fridges and things like that as well, just little incremental changes. Um, and also one of the things that I really wanted to write about was this um, sense of a sort of impossibility of um, sort of setting yourself up in the sort of economic circumstances that we 
find ourselves. As I've talked about earlier, the kind of um, pattern of finishing university, graduating, not really getting yourself sorted out, and then being able to move back in with your parents who um, generously take you back in. But it made me think of perhaps the increasing majority for whom that isn't really an option. What are you going to do? You're going to turn down the wallpaper conservatory bed sit for 1200 a month. And, and increasingly, these are going to be people in their 20s and 30s with demanding full time professional careers in which you used, in which, um, you used to be able to support a family. And I think, and while I was writing, I thought this, if it's not possible to do that on, for instance, a teacher's salary anymore, increasingly it isn't, we need to ask ourselves what a society that says about us and what we value. So housing was naturally an issue to pitch forwards. It's a basic economic fact that if um, food prices inflated at the same rate as the income to house price ratio, a loaf of bread would cost the best part of 20 quid. I hope I can say this without sounding stupid or bitter, because some of my best friends are homeowners, but um, property ownership is going to be quite a meaningful class distinction, I think, over the next, over the next couple of decades. It's going to be something that really divides people. Um, I hope that I could write something which dramatised those conditions while simultaneously acknowledging my own sense of entitlement, privilege and tendency towards self-sabotage, and also steering clear of buzzwords like millennials, which make my stomach turn. I am, um, at the age of 36, born in 1981, I am the oldest it's possible to be um, as a millennial. Um, I think that's it, I think the cut point is 81, summer of 1981. Yeah, so I'm the oldest millennial, a grey millennial. Um, I didn't want the aspirational elements of the transition to seem dismissive. If your dream is to make millions and design tableware, that's great, but it's daft to pretend you're not going to leave a lot of failed tableware designers in your way. The scheme solution overlooks the fact that most of us are punters rather than providers. We have to be, otherwise the providers wouldn't make any money. Just as any profit made on the stock exchange is someone else's loss, someone else's savings evaporating. The bottom line of this kind of creeping privatisation is large-scale disenfranchisement. It's an unspoken philosophy that if you are worried about the future of the NHS or state schooling or welfare, then you should make money, make money, make money, opt out, go private, insulate yourself and those who are immediately responsible for and watch everyone else go to hell from a safe distance. And God help those of us who are sick or become sick or have mental health conditions. What were we thinking when we chose not to become wealthy entrepreneurs? It's not a world that I want to live in, not least because I think it entrenches the very limited idea of who gets to write, who gets to impose their worldview, who controls the means of representation. And that means in journalism and publishing, at times, becomes something of a dynasty, with all the attendant blinkers. Um, the idea that we're all middle class now becomes one of the most egregious lies when applied so broadly to the ordinary working lives of at least 85% of us and the time fraction who can afford, say, private education at the term we fee of more than most people's annual salaries. It feels more like a way of allowing extreme economic privilege to hide in plain sight, to masquerade as a meritocracy, and turns those of us against each other who have far more in common than our specific coffee order, who cannot in all honesty say that they've never drunk a latte when lattes are available from swimming pool vending machines. That need for nuance, for subtlety, for kind of demythologizing the images and the words that thrown at us is reason enough to keep on writing. Thank you. For <laughs> Probably 10 minutes or so for That's questions. If anyone's got any questions to ask, Becca will take control of the microphone we'll um, to go out into the audience. Have you got a question? You said at the beginning, one of the questions that your supervisor asked you was, what's your reason for publishing? Yeah. What is the, what's the meaning behind it for you? So I'm just wondering if you could maybe sum that up a little bit. Yeah. 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 Clearly, I think it's something you discover by writing, like what, what the reason is for doing this with. Well, it's, it's always an act of communication. It always has to be, it relies on um, someone being interested in or engaging with what your story is or with your dialogue. Or your I mean, I think, it's, I think it's that need to make sense of your own life and in doing that, I think give other people permission to do that as well. I think, I mean, it's, it's a, yeah, it's a question I turn over in my mind a lot. I don't think I have a perfect it's answer. It's bigger than 35 and the second yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, but, but it's, yeah, it's one that I... Right. Um, I think Thank you very much. Um, I was just wondering, as a sort of aspiring writer in the last year at um, university here, and I, you know, wake up cold sweats in the night kind of thing, and I feel I'm a long way from finding my narrative voice 
So what I want to write, whether it's poetry, short fiction, science fiction, yeah. all three. Um, and I do write every day, a variety of them. What would your advice be, just to sort of carry on and it, it'll come to you in time? Or yeah, I think that seems like really unhelpful. But just carry on. With it. <laughs> um, like I think you have to be really patient with yourself, and I think you have to. I think particularly with something like the novel you sort of need to expect it not to go so well the first couple of times that you try it. The first novel I tried to write, which ended up being about 120,000 words, and it was sort of a story about four siblings, um, various sort of intersections in their stories, but it just didn't hang together, it didn't have an overall story, it just wasn't, it wasn't a novel basically, it was just a really long piece of writing, <laughs> you know, it just didn't, and, and, and you have to, so you have to be, it's that mixture of being quite brutal with yourself and admitting when something isn't working, even if you put like years of work into it. Just being like, actually, like with that one, I couldn't even fillet it for a short story or something. There just wasn't anything to it, really. Eventually, I had to kind of walk away from it. So being quite brutal with yourself, at the same time as being very patient with yourself, and just being like, this will, this will come eventually in every, and it is a process in the same way that it's not similar to just sort of rehearsing something, rehearsing an instrument, rehearsing a play. It does, you do improve, you do learn. I think so much more about yourself, about what you can bring to a form. I think it's also, it's also, um, you need to kind of find a way of making the form work for you. Like if you, I think if you are sort of primarily a poet, then you need to think, well actually I need to write something that has quite short chapters, I need to write something that actually I don't get bored of, because otherwise the reader's going to get totally bored of it as well, and I need to kind of find a way of using the things that I'm good at in this different form, if you're trying to kind of make the move from one form to another, and, and, and just think in those terms, think of ways that actually keep it interesting for you. So like some of the best books recently, there's a, um, they do sort of break rules and sort of push, like Amon like, like Cry to Girls are Half-Full Thing, sort of neo-modernist kind of philosophy. So it does all have that kind of narrative thrust to it, but it's a difficult book, and it was really exciting to see that being as much of a sort of hit as it, as it, as it, as it was. So there aren't, there, it doesn't have to be just one thing, a novel doesn't have to be just this particular kind of thing. So find, sort of find your own way of making it work for you rather than sort of enslaving yourself to the form of the novel would be my general advice. And just keep Thank you very much, appreciate it. Speaking of failures, yeah. I'm coming to the end of a very long book project and I'm feeling this off by working out. It's actually a PhD program project. Um, do you have any advice for finishing that kind of project? Finishing yeah. PhD. Yeah. I found it quite an unpleasant experience finishing quite. I, I, I wrote this sort of long tract on the prose poem, its kind of history of what it does as a form, what it's kind of for. I think I only read the argument only really. I had these kind of isolated chapters that really sort of stood alone. They were about specific like I had a chapter on Ancast and a chapter on Max and Chernoff and. Um, there was no through line, there was no actual argument that made it into a monograph or an actual thesis. And this was something that I had to kind of almost panic and reverse engineer in the last year of, of, of doing it. And I just think, well, what, what, is, what are the commonalities here that I've identified? And then kind of rewrite it with that in mind. It's, I think, but I think the final year is always this kind of horrible experience. It is where you, and you and, but also I think you are sort of, you're most likely to be really, really down on yourself and really hard on yourself during that final year when, it's, when you're shaping up towards the, the deadline. You are more than usually likely to sort of question what you've done and to doubt what you've done. So I mean, that, that, this, yeah, this, that sounds self-help. All normal. Hmm? All normal. Yeah, totally normal. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 and also like you're being, you're probably being like too critical of yourself. Like it probably actually is good enough. But I think like, you know, like, like, like sometimes we think of it as normal way. They're actually sort of the beginning. This is going to be your kind of first investigation into a theme, which, which, should you continue in academia, you'll be exploring. Forever, you know, it's kind of so. It kind of has to be this kind of start, like something that suggests and that and that opens questions up and that kind of opens up further reading and further writing. So I think that's that's kind of yeah, that's my schmaltzy advice. <laughs> but good luck. It's really, it's really tough. Cheers. Hi, um, I'm Jeff. I'm from Oxford. Um, I really enjoyed your talk. I find that quite difficult in my own uh, poetry writing. Um, yeah. I was wondering what kind of advice you have on that, and trying to address that balance. Yeah, I mean, I suppose if we think about, um, like, I, I, I suppose there would be nothing more tedious than listening to a kind of anti-Trump poem, right? Right now, if I read one to you, it would just be—I'd be so sort of stating the obvious. Um, there wouldn't really be many people in the world who would disagree, um, apart from the sort of 
crazy supporters of you know, who, who like who even you know try. I think it's, it would be interesting to write about the kind of the weird sort of logical knots that we've tied ourselves in over arguing about Trump. But maybe writing a poem about how it's not really possible to write a poem about Donald Trump might make for an interesting piece of writing. But I think it's it's kind of trying to avoid being didactic. It's trying to avoid. Um, sort of preaching to the, to the converted in a way, particularly with poetry, so, so not sort of giving people something obvious, and using, sometimes using a kind of satirical technique that goes beyond just the grotesque, or just sort of pointing out. I mean, it's, it's, it's tricky right now to engage politically also, because I think things have splintered quite a lot as well, like even, even within the same side, you know, there's, there's so much sort of factionality and, and anger and sort of tendency to call one another out for ideological impurity. Um, so it's a tricky time to be writing politically, I think. And I think it's, it's, it's just a case of, um, I think also that it's okay to be confused. It's okay to be like, oh, this is very off-putting and confusing. <laughs> I sort of want to, I kind of dramatize that and just do it through characters, even in poems, do it through sort of um, speculation and voices and, and, and details. So trying to sort of go with that rather than a message, because in a way you can, you can just, like Douglas Adams said, if I wanted to write a message, I'd have written a message, I wrote a, I wrote a novel. And it's sort of like, like a work of art has a sort of different, a different impact and a different practice, and it can be ambivalent, I think, as well, in a way, to, to be this sort of clear statement. Yeah, but best of luck with that, because it's a hard time to be writing politically. <laughs> um, Matt, time for one more quick one, please, yeah? One more, one more. Yeah. Know, um, more about the active writing for you, um, whether you feel like a different writer when you're writing poetry as opposed to poetry. Mm. Yeah, that, that's great. Yeah. yeah, I really, really do. Um, and, and I really enjoy writing poetry, and I find prose an absolute grind. I find prose just to um, sort of force myself to do it, to force myself to go to my desk at night, and then I just have to not get up until I've written a thousand words. A lot of it will be rubbish, a lot of it will be fairly... You know, sometimes just getting all of your characters into the right room so they can have the conversation you to have and be like a whole day's work with prose, I feel like. You know, it, 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 and, it, and it's... I kind of hate it much of the time, and it's in sort of later drafts that I actually have some more fun, where I feel like I can be sort of winched down into particular scenes um, and improve them slightly, and sort of punch up the dialogue a bit and try to... Try to make the content slightly subtle, include a couple of images. I quite like some clean, straightforward prose as well, so I tend not to, um, I think I was very aware of not wanting to write a kind of poet's novel with the transition. Um, but yeah, the process is totally different. Poetry I really like, I think I only write poetry when I feel like writing poetry as well, so it's, it's something that I actually enjoy, and it's something that I feel like I can make something out of the kind of collage of different ideas and scraps and things that I have in notebooks, and, and just, I suppose also I feel like I know what I'm doing a bit more with, with the kind of poetry that I write. Um, but I do feel like it uses a sort of different, I don't know, this, is, this probably isn't sort of neuroscientifically sound, but I feel like it uses a different part of, part of the brain in a way. I feel like, it, I feel like a different person when I'm writing poetry and prose. I don't know, I don't, I'm not sure what other kind of people who work across, across different forms and genres feel about that. But I think just that sense of having to keep the overall story in mind so much for the novel and having to just it's like I was saying earlier, but you have to find a way of making it enjoyable for yourself. I, mean, I, need to, I know where I need to get here, I know what I need to get these characters to do at some point, right? this needs to happen, and then sort of almost just, with the project writing at the moment, I've started just making a list of like these key scenes, so that whenever I sit down, there's always something that I can just be like, right, this has to happen in this scene, let's actually try and enjoy it, for God's sake, instead <laughs> of just being sort of miserable, um, slugging out <laughs> into a thousand words in a few hours. But yeah, but yeah it, does, it does feel really different to me, I don't really know why. But Thank you so much for your generosity and attention. It's been a pleasure to see you. Thank you very much.